Thank you all so much for that. I just want to remind us, because I know this is our Christmas Sunday. I know churches uh, happen to be a little more full than they usually are, and that's a good thing. But I just want to take this opportunity. I want to be very specific for us this morning. I know there are some here uh, who are really close to Jesus. You walk with Jesus every day, and you're intimate with him, and you're growing in him, and we're so thankful to have you here. I know there are some here today who uh, you may come to church every week, but you are nominally associated with Jesus. You're not really intimate with him, uh, and that's okay. We are so glad you're here. There are some of you here today, you're far from Christ. You're far from Jesus. You're a Christian, but you have not even really thought of Jesus except for today when somebody in your family asks you to come to church. And you may be here, you're one of those people, your uh, extended family or something, you're here visiting with family and, and you don't know Christ and, and you're here just because you're being nice, you don't want to be that rude person that stays at somebody's house and not goes to church when they leave, right? Uh, that's okay. Every one of you, God has brought you here today. And I want you to take this moment extremely serious when we talk about this. God has brought you here today. He has you here to experience the wonder of his birth. To encounter Jesus. To be filled with the Spirit of God. To, as you hear the songs, as you hear the prayers, as we listen to the message. None of this is by accident that God has you here None of this is mundane. It is all for a very intentional purpose that God has you here this morning. And I want to encourage you with everything in me to listen for Christ this morning. Today could be the day that Jesus literally changes your life. Don't just allow this day to just be a random Sunday. But this could be the day that God makes you anew today. Amen? If you have your Bibles, I want to ask you if you will turn to Luke chapter 2 with me. We're going to do this uh, remarkable Christmas story that nobody's heard, right? If you're a senior adult here and you were here for our lunch, Brother Hayden kind of gave you a brief overview of what we're going to cover this morning. Uh, he did a great job with our seniors at our lunch this past Thursday. When I was about 12 years old, I had a job working for the convenience store that was right across the road from my house. Every day after school, I would go, I would stock the shelves, I would sweep the floor, I would stock the merchandise all around the store, I would do whatever else the manager needed me to do, take out the trash. It took me about two and a half hours every day to do this after school. It, you know, you're 12. Uh, this was back, uh, I mean, this was in, in the 90s, so this is like super far time ago, right? Uh, really long time ago in the early 90s. And, uh, but, you know, that was cool. And, and I loved it because he paid me, he gave me $5 an hour. That was a whole lot of money. $5 an hour to a 12-year-old in the early 90s? That was a lot, Brother Phil. I mean, that was a lot of money, you know? And so I, I had my little money, and uh, I used to, I used to, I loved it because I could take it. I put it in my top dresser drawer at the house. I love it. Whenever I want something, I ain't had to ask nobody for nothing. It was my money, right? And so, but the only problem was, is I love spending my money, but I found out my brother also loved spending my money. <laughs> he also knew where my top dresser drawer was. And so to alleviate this problem, I decided to take that money and I hid it in a super secret place that he couldn't find. And the problem is, almost 30 years later, I still haven't found that money. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's safe. Or I really think he may have found it, Holly, and never told me. But I looked and I looked and I never found that money. We moved out of that trailer and I never found it. Many of us do with Jesus what I did with that money. The non-believer, the non-Christian, you'll find yourself putting Jesus so deep away, saying no to him so many times, rejecting his plea for your redemption and washing of sin so adamantly that you never find him again. When the going gets tough, when you've reached the bottom, when you're at the end, you find yourself without salvation. And it's not because Christ is not offered. 
It's not because he hasn't knocked so many times. It's not because in a moment he would not rescue you if you called to him. But after saying no for so long and so many times, you've forgotten where to go for redemption and salvation. But we as believers, we really don't get off much easier. Ours is almost as grievous of a sin. We respond to Jesus. We accept his free gift of salvation. But what happens is, as a Christian, we hide him so well. And not only do we fail to tell anyone else of his life-saving relationship with him, we don't allow Christ to impact our lives at all because we've hid him so well, even from ourselves. And this morning, as we look at Luke chapter 2, And we examine this Christmas story. Two very familiar questions come to mind this morning. Is there room for Jesus in my life? Is there room for Jesus in my life? And the second question is also very simple. Am I responding to Jesus properly? Am I responding to Jesus properly? Father, as we begin to come and open your word this morning, would you speak to us now by the power of that word, by the filling of your spirit, that we may know you, grow in you, Father God. Lord, would you speak to our hearts this morning? Would you draw us in? Would you wrap your glorious arms around us? And would you comfort us by your word? Show us the gift that you are for our good and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A Chicago nightclub had a fire in which 21 people were killed, not from the fire, but from the rush to the exit. The club had already been cited for overcrowding many times and for other safety violations like not having enough doors, not having enough windows. And what happened was actually no fire at all, but a bouncer used pepper spray to break up a fight, and some people thought that it was a chemical weapons attack, and they fled down the narrow hallway trampling 21 people to death as they ran. Then a, another nightclub in Rhode Island saw 96 people killed, 50 others injured as they desperately tried to escape a fire started when the band used some pyrotechnics that went awry. The news report very interestingly said many people died from injuries. They were badly cut from smashing windows and glass in a frantic attempt to get out of the building. And what was very interesting about this particular club in Rhode Island is that just the week before, they were featured on the news as being one of the safest places for entertainment in the state. One minute, everybody was having a great time. Dancing, drinking, laughing. The next minute, minute they're screaming in terror in a mindless attempt to escape death and destruction. But you think about that. If you would roll back the hours to that evening before anyone arrived as they were prepping and getting ready and putting on their best and trying to look their best and somebody were to warn them that, hey, something's going to happen tonight at that nightclub. I don't think you should go. How many of them would actually took that warning serious? No one ever really believes a disaster is going to happen until it does, do they? No one ever really believes the miracle is going to happen until it does, do they? We take our lives for granted often until something turns our world upside down. Our eyes skip right over the danger signs. We do not even hear the sirens. We don't see the guardrails. It must be for someone else. The bell is tolling for someone else. See, the people in this nightclub suffered, really honestly, if we're going to just boil it down to uh, just a very tangible thing for the building itself from a lack of room. They made no room for their own safety, steadily plucking away at life, enjoying the moment day by day, every indulgence, every happiness, every fleet of passion of flesh, and suddenly they realized they were in trouble. And when we fail to make room for things that truly are important in our life, what happens is we end up missing a blessing and sometimes we suffer greatly for it. As we look at the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to see very familiar that there was no room for him at the end. But I think this is going to beg a question for us to ask. Is there room for Jesus in our lives? If you will, if you have your Bibles, we're going to find ourselves in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Crinius was governor of Syria. 
And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. He did so in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them at the end. So here we are. We have had the conversation. Mary has been found to be with child. Joseph goes and, and considers these things. He is prayerful over them. The Lord speaks to him, says, hey, this is, this is my son. Within him you will raise him. Uh, you will not divorce her. Joseph follows through in obedience. He, he marries her. He stays with Mary. They come down. They're in Nazareth. Joseph, he's a carpenter by trade. He's more than likely working in Capernaum which is a growing uh, port city right across the way. He's doing his thing. He's having a great time. And then Caesar says, hey, there's a census. And what that means, everybody has to go back to, you, to your grandpa's house, basically. Go back to where your grandpa came from. So they get up and they leave Nazareth. Nazareth is about 97.3 miles from Bethlehem. So they're traveling down to Bethlehem. And I love the idea of, of thinking they're traveling to Bethlehem with Mary, who is pregnant, and she gets to ride this donkey. I've never been pregnant but I've had a sweet cake of a wife who's been pregnant multiple times. And I can tell you we've traveled while she's nine months pregnant. We've sat still in a car. We've sat on a couch. We've laid in a bed. At no position you're in at nine months pregnant are you enjoying any of life. So just imagine this, this 97 and a half mile ride on a donkey to another town. Speed up, slow down, Joseph. I need some more blankets up here, right? And then think of Joseph. I, I, I'm trying, I've read over this passage, and I'm trying to picture this scene. Men, you understand where Joseph is at right here. Could you imagine, I mean, think of Bethlehem. Usually it has anywhere from 300 to 1,000 residents. It's going to swell during this time to about three or four times its population. So imagine DeSoto, 6,500 people here. Imagine it being 18,000 to 25,000 people for about three months. We don't, with no extra room, right? You got to find a place. So this is the situation here. So could you imagine, guys, there's no orbits. There's no Airbnb. You know, Verbo is not there, right? So imagine Joseph going from place to place and, hey, y'all got some room? No, sir, we're all full up. Y'all got some room? No, you should have been here earlier. Well, I was traveling with a pregnant woman, man. I can't only go so fast, right? Could you imagine? I mean, man, you know this. You know the face. After about the sixth or seventh place he's looked, you know the face that he's going to get when he turns around and looks at her on that donkey, right? But then imagine, he goes up to this one guy. He knocks on the door, and he says, hey, man, I'm full up. He says, but I got some room in the back in the, in, in the, where the manger. And it's not this outside scene that we usually see. It's, 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 it's covered. It's not four walls, but it's covered. It's semi-outside, semi-inside, you know, uh, where the animals are staying during, during the cold night so they can keep warm and they can keep fed and all this stuff. And could you imagine, you know, jo all Joseph hears is, I got a room. He, it never processes to him where it's at, probably if he's being a real guy, right? All he hears is, I got room. And so could you imagine his joy as he runs back up to that donkey? He says, Mary, guess what? And she says, well, we got a room. And she says, where is it at? I don't want to walk up two flights stairs. He says, good news, you don't have to walk up any stairs. It's in the manger. What? And then you imagine they go back and, you, you, you know, men, and, and you, your wife's nine months pregnant. He's doing everything he possibly can to keep that smile on his face and make sure she's comfortable. They're laying there in the middle of the night, and she says, Joseph, I think I'm going to have a baby. Well, Mary, I know you are. Mary, you're nine months pregnant. No, dummy. I'm having the baby. What? Right? And in a moment... In an instant, eternity is forever changed. Forever changed. The creator of the universe, who needs nothing, who has never wanted for anything, who has never desired a thing, is now 
born in a manger, needing attention. His mother, his father, needing to be fed and nursed and clothed and held. In an instant, in a moment, the one who created trees is now laying in a trough of a manger built by the very tree he created. The Savior of the world, the King of glory, leaves heaven. Leaves heaven and comes to be born on this earth. The Lord of glory is going to live a life who's only ever been, since he created angels, has only ever had angels praising him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And yet he will live this life in constant need of clothes and food and water and shelter. Who's only ever known glory and admiration, awe and wonder, willingly laid that aside humbled himself to the point of death on a cursed cross so that you and I, those deserving of death, and I'm sorry if you think yourself better than that, but all of us are wretched sinners deserving of death, hell, and eternal grave. He leaves heaven, is born in a manger to live a life, to die on a tree so that we who would place our faith in his finished work on the cross in his glorious resurrection might now, who has returned to heaven and is sitting on his throne, might now join him in glory forever. That is what that manger scene signifies. Hundreds of of prophecies, thousands of years in a moment fulfilled in this manger scene. Mary and Joseph could not imagine for a moment the significance, the comprehensiveness of what was taking place. No one, think about this, no one save a few shepherds in a few fields a few miles away knew of this historic event. There are a few lessons I want to pull from this simple passage. First thing, when you think about Mary and Joseph, think about Mary and Joseph with me for a moment. God can call you to do the most unexpected thing at the most unexpected time for His glory. God can call you to do the most unexpected thing at the most unexpected time for His glory. Think of Mary, young, assuming Mary, engaged to be married. Now she is given the opportunity and privilege to bear the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Joseph, he's a young man. He's just trying to make it. You know what it is, man, when you just start out, you're just married. You're just trying to provide. And, and, and is that's not hard enough. God says, hey, I want you to raise the Savior of the world. Oh, that's not a big deal, right? Beloved, your circumstances may not be ideal. Your situation might be the best. You might not have your life together like you want. But those things never can mean that God cannot use you for His glory. And you say, well, I'm, I'm in school and, and God can't really use me at my school. And it doesn't matter if you're in elementary school or junior high or high school. If you're in college, God can and wants to use you for His glory. God wants to use you in your classroom. God wants to use you in in your sports, on your scholarships. God wants to use you on the fields. He wants to use you at the science fairs. He wants to use you to tell people of how much he loves them. You say, Pastor, you don't understand. I, I work six days a week. This is the only day I get off. I don't have time to really do anything for God. You're missing the big picture. You are a missionary wherever you're at for the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a missionary you say, well, I can't talk about Jesus at my work. You may not can talk about him, but guess what you can do? You can pray for your coworkers. You can read your Bible during lunchtime. You can ask them if, if they're having a hard time. You can ask them if you can pray for them or with them after work. You don't, you don't have to run around jingling the evangelism bell to serve Jesus. God's not looking for the most qualified. He's not searching for the best looking or the best finance. He's not trying to see which family has it all together. 
He's simply looking for humble and obedient individuals who are willing to step out in faith and serve him. You never know what that cup of coffee you give to someone can mean. That phone call or text message is letting them know that you thought enough of them to simply pray for them. You say, well, praying is not much. I want you to think about how important, how big prayer is. When you let someone know you're praying for me, when someone texts me and lets me know that they're praying for me, you know what that means? That means they thought enough of me to pause, even for 15 seconds of their day, to lift my name up to the Lord God, creator on high, and ask him for a favor on my behalf. That's huge. You never know what that hug in the hallway is going to mean. That hand on the shoulder. You never know how those few small steps of obedience can have an impact. Don't wait, beloved, for your life to be perfect. And another thing we often do, we tell ourselves, hey, I can't do this or that for Jesus because I'm not at this or that spiritual level to be able to do those things for Christ. That's hogwash. Let me throw it out there. I look at a brother, Don Williams, one of the most godly men I've ever met in my life. So faithful to care for this church. How many people he calls and checks on. Who's ever had a phone call from brother Don? Raise your hand, right? I look at a brother Don, I'm like, I could never get to a brother Don Williams spirituality. He's so godly, he's so mature, he's so faithful to care for his bride, to look out for those around him. But you know what? Brother Don didn't just wake up yesterday and become the spiritual man that he is. And don't worry, he's not paying me extra. He didn't know I was talking about him. It's all good. I'm embarrassing him for free. But I'm using him to make an example because this is really important. Brother Don was a young man in his 20s, in his 30s, in his 40s. He was a middle-aged man in his 50s and his 60s. And, and now he's at is these golden years enjoying life and still serving Christ. But you know what he did? He served even though he wasn't at the spiritual maturity level he is now. And you know how he got to the spiritual maturity level he is now? By continuing to serve. It doesn't matter where you're at in life. God can use you. None of us are perfect. And I, I'm reminded of this every day. I, I can't even dress myself without telling, getting told in the morning times, don't wear that shirt. Now, to be honest, my sweet bride, she's super sweet. She is lovely. She never tells me don't wear that. She simply asks the question, are you sure you want to wear that? <laughs> and I'm wise enough now. I used to be like, sure. Now I realize that's not so much a question, is it? What God may call you to do, listen to this, this is really important, especially for our young people here. Especially for our young people. Those who are in, in, in high school, you may be in college, you may be in that 18 to 25 year old window. I want you to hear this. This is really important for all of us, but it's very important for you. What God can call you to do may not be what you envisioned yourself doing. And that's okay. What God may call you to do may not be envisioned what you thought you would do. And that is okay. We must make the most of the moment because we never know what our obedience will bring. Here's the deal. We only have a limited amount of time on this earth. We have a limited amount of time. That's why Paul, as he's talking to us in, in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, make the most of the time that you have. He says, be efficient with the time that God has given you. We only have so much time to live for His glory. We only have so much time to tell people of Jesus. We only have so much time to serve in His name. We only have so much time to build others up in Christ. We have so much time to forgive those who have wronged us. We only have so much time to rejoice in God's goodness, to glorify Him in this life. We never know what our obedience is going to bring. Martyr Diedrich Bonhoeffer said, one act of obedience is better than 100 sermons. It's not about these sermons. It's not about the songs. It's not about the studies. It's about how those things are impacting your life. Are we loving others as ourselves? 
Are we loving God with all that is in us? Are we obedient to his word and his call both in things little and those that are large? We never know. And the question is, will we commit to obeying God no matter the call? Will you commit to obey God's call on your life to love, to serve, to minister? Is there room for Jesus in your life? Second question we see from verse 8 is their response for Jesus. Look at verse 8 with me. In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that had happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry. They found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statements which had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen just as they had been told. Andrew Murray makes a statement I think is very important for us considering this passage. He says, there is nothing so hardening as delay. When God speaks to us, he asks for a tender heart, open to the whispers of his voice of love. The believer who answers the today of the Holy Ghost with the tomorrow of some more convenient season knows not how he is hardening his heart. The delay, instead of making the surrender and obedience and faith easy, makes it more difficult. It closes the heart for today against the comforter and cuts off all hope and power of growth. Many individuals, both believers and unbelievers alike, have felt the tug of the Holy Spirit on your heart, the touch of God in your life, the whisper of His still small voice. You've experienced a strong conviction of sin, a call upon your life which could not be ignored. Even others of us have been hit over the head with the word of God that you cannot deny. Yet even with this tugging, this leading, this conviction, many of us do not respond to the Lord in obedience, do we? Some of us flat out deny Him. Others reject Him and still others, and you may find yourself in this group this morning, you delay Him. And when we delay God, we justify it to ourselves because we tell ourselves we didn't say no. We're not saying no to the Lord, to the Holy Spirit. We say tomorrow. We say not right now. We say, I'm not ready at this time, Lord. You don't know what I'm going through. I want you to think about telling the Lord you don't know what you're going through. Think about that. Think about you telling God you're not ready. I want you to I mean, really, seriously consider that statement for a moment. God, I'm not ready. I wonder the look on his face when he says something like that. That's like, and we we had this this morning. I was putting Jacob's shoes on. Kristen came in there, and she said, did you put those shoes on him? I said, "Mm -mm, he did that. That wasn't me. I did put those shoes on him, but I wasn't about to take that rap. He was right there. He could take the rap for himself, right? Mm -mm." She says, those shoes don't fit him. I said, they do fit him. She says, but they don't look good on him. I said, I hate them. Let's get them off of him, right? They're the ugliest shoes I've ever seen. So I said, go get the other ones. So we put the other shoes on. And I tell Jacob, I said, hey, go get the other shoes. And he says, I don't want to do that. I said, son, go get the other shoes. He goes, he goes I, I don't want to do that. He's, I said, son, I am the daddy. Go get the shoes. I don't understand the confusion. It's what, whatever you're saying to me, I do not care. There's a volcano could blow up beside you. I want you to walk through it and get the shoes and bring them back to me, right? That's what I want. 
Now imagine God telling us, hey, I want you to step out and serve in this way. I want to call you to this particular ministry team in this church family. I want you to get involved in this activity that the church is doing in this mission area. And you say, God, I don't want to do that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? As a five-year-old telling your daddy you didn't want to do something, telling your mama you didn't want to do something, how, what would they do to you? Right? I get thrown through a plate glass window maybe. I don't know. I just, I think it's, I think it's really strange that we really believe God is doing everything for our good and His glory. That those we are called according to a purpose. That God works everything out for our lives according to His purpose for our good and His glory. We really believe that. But yet we somehow still believe that and then we'll simultaneously say, God, not right now. Those things don't make sense, do they? That you can't marry those ideas, can you? And instead of following God in obedience and experiencing His best, we put off His calling, His love, His compassion, His direction for later. But often, if we're honest, later never comes because the more we say later, the more we say not now, the more we say not yet, what we're really saying is no to God because even though we sincerely intend to do what He says to do later, what happens is we delay obedience, we delay following Christ, we make it easier to continue to say later next time until later soon turns into no. And no soon turns into we don't hear him anymore. So I ask this morning, beloved, is there a response for Jesus in your heart that he's calling you to do something? I want to look at three responses as we think about these shepherds. These shepherds heard the news of the Messiah born in Bethlehem. They responded to this great news with some appropriate actions. And I think it's neat that the first person God informs of the birth of his son in the world are the lowliest employees, the lowliest people in the workforce in their culture. That the shepherds would know first and celebrate the great shepherd, right? The first thing I think we see is praise. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. The glory of Jesus should elicit praise from his people. So just imagine with me. We're out there, maybe it's four or five of us, and we got our different flocks all up. Maybe we got three or 400 sheep total. And we're out there, we're hanging out uh, with our sheep together. We're huddled up. We're telling stories of, of the family. We're telling how little Junior uh, got into, uh, to play stickball with the rocks out there in Bethlehem. And all that fun stuff is happening. And then we're, we're just hanging, we're drinking some coffee. We're chilling, we're hanging out, we're looking at these sheep. We're counting over and over. And, and, and you set the scene, we're on these, these really good hillsides, lush green grass. Look at the, the starry sky. You've looked up at skies like that here in, in Jefferson County, right? Just blue and black and just the whitest, whitest stars, brightest stars you've ever seen. Super cool, crisp, clear night. Quiet. The sheep have laid down for the night. There's no bleeding. There's no bellowing. And then could you imagine? All of a sudden, you're standing there with four or five of your buddies, and then you don't see somebody walk up. They're not coming from a distance. You didn't hear nothing. You don't hear no gravel. You didn't hear no, nothing shift. But all of a sudden, this guy appears right before you and says, Hey, dude, what's up? That's, a, that's not in the Bible. I just, just. He says, hey, I got some great news for you. Everything you've been desiring has come true tonight. Glory to God in the highest. And then is it, if that wasn't enough, I want you to just try to imagine. Try to imagine you're there. And this guy in the shining white is standing before you. And then all of a sudden, at the moment he finishes that statement, at the moment he finishes telling you that Jesus Christ has been born, that he's come to save his people, that moment, the sky literally parts. And as you look up, you see hundreds of the angels of heaven created by God himself burst open in a heavenly choir and start singing? That'll get you right quick, won't it? Could you imagine that? And what's so beautiful to me as I read this scene and think about the descriptions of what's happening, 
It is their response of praise at the news of Jesus that excites me. It encourages me. But if I'm going to be honest, it also convicts me. At the thought of what Jesus has done for me. Of what He is doing for me right now. Of what He will do for me because of my salvation in Him. I have to ask myself, does that bring continuous praise to my heart? Songs to my mind. Glory on my lips for Him. And I sadly tell you, not enough. Beloved, there's something wrong with a people who claim salvation from sin, who have a living Savior on the throne right now, making prayers and intercessions for them, who is filled with the very Spirit of God, who have a promised hope of heaven, and we still walk around with giraffe and donkey faces. Like we're sad and mad at the world. The sign of someone who is joyful about something, who is stunned about something, who's overwhelmed about something is, is praise. The praises of the saints should be on our hearts and lips daily because daily we are benefiting from Jesus' birth and His death and His resurrection. The second thing we see is sharing. If we've experienced Jesus, we are called to share Him with others. When they seen this, verse 17, they made known to the statement which had been told to them a child, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told to them by shepherds. After hearing of the glorious occurrence of what had been told to them, they rush as fast as they can to Bethlehem. They want to find Mary and Joseph. They want to tell them. They want to see this promised Messiah, this promised King. They verified the words of the angel. They told Mary and Joseph. The combination of the angel's revelation and the realization was Christ was too much for them. They could not contain themselves. They had to share what had been done to them in their lives. This again brings me to examine my own life. I am the recipient of the greatest gift has ever known. Salvation. Through Jesus. Because of his death, his burial and resurrection, God looks at me not in wrath, Not in judgment. He looks at me with love and compassion. And he calls me not sinner but son. And he does the same to every one of us here. Who have been called in Christ. Who have responded to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Who have placed our faith in Christ. How could we not share what God has done for us? How can we not share that he could do the same for others? How can our lives not be dedicated to serve Him, to love Him, to obey Him? How could we call ourselves a disciple of the follower of Jesus Christ and not tell of the good news of the gospel? Beloved, to call ourselves believers, to call ourselves disciples of Jesus and yet withhold the gift we have been given is criminal. So we ask ourselves, do we enjoy the benefits of salvation? Yes. Why are we not telling more people about it? We should be willing to do whatever is needed. Live however we are called to live. Go wherever He has called us to go. Have whatever attitude He calls us to have. Serve and minister in whatever manner He has told us to so that others might be afforded the same opportunity we have in Jesus Christ. The third thing we see is praising, is sharing and glorifying. Look at verse 20. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen just as had been told to them. If we truly know what we are saved from, we will regularly and joyfully glorify God with our lives. What I love this is once the crowds had dissipated, once they were away from Mary and Joseph, they were simply three, four, five of them walking down the road together back to their humble fields. Think about it. Wouldn't you hate to have been the guy left behind to watch those sheep? Hey, that's a bad short straw to draw, isn't it? But I want you to think about this, because this is, this is very relevant to us. How often, after God has blessed us in such a magnificent way, how He has tenderly and mercifully answered our prayers, how often, when, when the lights have faded, when the people have moved on, and we're just there in our silence and ourselves, maybe a day or two later, how often have we found ourselves forgetting about the answer? Forgetting about the blessing. Forgetting to praise Him. Beloved, there is always, always, always something 
to praise God for. Many of us here have been saved and have or had a relationship with Jesus for a long time. Some are fairly new in your walk with Jesus. Whatever the case, let me ask you, are you glorifying God with your attitude? With your speech? With your social media posting? With your behavior? With your resources? With your ministry? Beloved, let us never get to the point of our walk with Jesus Christ that we treat Him, that we treat this relationship as ordinary because it is anything but. May we always be in awe of Him and mindful of Him. Let's always glorify Him. As Brother James and our team come, I want to ask if you would, would you stand with me please? We're going to have our invitation time. I'm going to pray and we're going to sing I'm going to be down here in the middle and brother Hayden and brother Gene will be on each one of these wings here and here is the invitation this morning we have an invitation because we believe the Bible calls for a response if you're here this morning and maybe you find yourself as a believer but you know you have not been responding to Jesus in the manner in which you should might I ask you, as I have read through this passage, as I think about the response of the shepherds, as I have been led to repentance in my own life and, and my responses to Jesus, may I call you to repentance as well and a commitment, a fresh commitment, maybe a recommitment to your life to serve Christ and honor Him. Maybe for you that's many things. Maybe it's following through in believer's baptism. Maybe it's starting the process to, to join our church family. Maybe you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And you say, well, I don't necessarily want to have one today. And this is just supposed to be a, a, a the day I'm here with family. This kind of one-off Sunday. Beloved, that's okay. That's all right. I promise you. You say, I don't necessarily want to, want to do that. Beloved, if God is calling you, listen to me. This is very important. Do not put off the tugging of the Holy Spirit on your heart. Fear may want you to keep your feet where they are. But Jesus is calling you to respond to Him don't delay. Don't delay. I'm going to pray, and as we sing, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the word of the Lord this morning. Father God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your word. And Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus right now, and I know, God, you are working in the heart's of these people this morning, your people this morning. I know you are calling some of us to repentance and faith for the first time. I know you're calling some of us to respond to you in a way that we have not responded to you in a while, God. I know there's fear working in our hearts, and I know there's a lot of things pulling on our minds right now. And I pray, God, I pray by the Holy Spirit of God right now, your spirit working in this room, that you help us lay aside whatever hinders us this morning. And that we would respond to your word. Father, glorify yourself now in these next few moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing, would you respond to the Lord this morning?